Welcome back to the Beyond the Scope podcast presented by MDMD Productions and today's sponsored by TrueLearn, but more on them later. I'm your host, Andy, senior year medical student, and here we continue the mission of sharing impactful stories from students, residents, and attendings of different medical professions while giving you an inside look into their lives, not just as healthcare workers, but the incredible people they are as well. But of course, we talk about here the things that all these years of medical training doesn't really prepare you for things that are beyond the scope of our practice. So that being said, let's introduce today's guest. And so believe it or not, uh, this is quite literally take three of this podcast. And I'm so grateful for this guest patient uh, throughout all the technical difficulties. And I think that's just a true testament for her character and her care for patients. And Maybe the t- other two episodes we recorded, or probably one of the other two, will release in an audio-only format, but... Anyways, I'm so happy to be able to meet and share the stories of fellow medical creators across different platforms, especially those who are strong and fearless advocates for physician wellness and lower income or lower resource students who want to pursue a career in medicine one day. One such creator I found as she advocated thoroughly uh, for physician wellness, academic perseverance, and celebration of life's small victories. And uh, she's today's guest. A newly graduated family medicine physician now on the other side of residency and helping the next generation of physicians stay strong in their own unique paths to becoming a doctor. Welcome to the Beyond the Scope podcast. Dr. K, how are you? Hi, thank you for having me, Andy. And I'm super excited to sit down and talk to you again. It is the third time, but third time's a charm. So I'm really excited for this to go perfectly. <laughs> I, I love how it's like, again, but no, it, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And uh, even the past few conversations we had were so just fulfilling and really inspirational. So I'm I'm super excited to dive into what we have today. And I think it's, it's one that's, it's a topic that's very, very close to my heart and something I haven't really addressed too much on my channel uh, yet. But before we get into that, um, you know, I try to put together decent intros for my guests. But for those who don't know you, can you tell us where you're from, where you went to medical school, and you know, maybe what these next couple months are going to look like now that you're done with residency? Of course. So um, as he mentioned, my name online is Dr. K, and I am from Texas. I went to medical school at UNT in Fort Worth um, and then did residency at the Texas Medical Center, um, finished my family medicine residency there, and I am cur- I was chief resident and I'm finally done. So that's super exciting. Um, I'm currently taking time off to enjoy time with family, and then I'm looking into um, signing a locums position um, here soon. So super excited for what's to come. And, you know, my platform started organically, I think, in medical school. And so I kind of used that over the years to update people and super excited to have connected people like you and others online. Yeah. And so you mentioned you started medical school kind of like very naturally. So can you get a deeper story of how you first got into this social media space? Absolutely. Honestly, I just... I just got done telling someone else the story too, but it was actually a way that I used to cope with a lot of what I was experiencing at the time, which was, as I look back, seems like I was depressed because of personal life issues, um, things that were going on that were kind of out of my control, um, health related issues that my family was dealing with. And so I used this space to kind of talk about medicine and honestly motivate myself every day. And what I found was that helping motivate myself was motivating other people in return. And so I shared up my struggles about, you know, medical school, um, how I got there, and then just how I was feeling. And I think that, you know, now we have these awesome creators who also join this open talk about mental health and having the lows that come with being a human, but also in medicine. And I'm just happy to have been in the space talking about this um, when I started. Yeah. And I mean, and I told you that, you know, one of my good friends, Jake Goodman, absolutely looks up to you. There's a ton of other creators that I've worked with that absolutely love your content. And it, you know, myself included, it's just so comforting to have someone advocating for us. And like, it sounds, it sounds terrible. It's like, well, no, duh, like you should be advocating for yourself. But I, I think so often in medicine, we just like, to the crushing pressure of like hierarchy where yeah. it's it's sometimes difficult and um 
few and far between to find somebody saying like, hey guys, uh, the thing that we've all accepted for so many years, that's kind of messed up. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I'm glad you mentioned Jake because I'm such a big fan of what he does on this platform as I know you are as well and, and everything you're doing as well. But it's so interesting because I get messages sometimes like of people saying that I'm brave and so great that you're talking about this. And I just hope we get to the point one day where these conversations are not ones of bravery, but rather like something that we can have more easily so that people can feel more accepted for their struggles and for the things that they experience. Because I think just because we're healthcare workers or, you know, devoting our life to serving others doesn't mean that we can't struggle and we can't experience the lows of it too. Absolutely. And I, I think something that, you know, helps all of us to connect with our audience is, you know, one, you know, communicating shared experiences. Um, and that comes in a, a lot of forms. Obviously, we are in medical training. So a lot of the unique perspectives of those struggles, uh, we can speak to and, you know, it's super comforting for other people to see that. Um, but something we talked about um, in our previous <laughs> recordings, um, was I think the importance of both like cultural um, and like faith connections mm -hmm. and how that is able to you know, speak to a deeper level of understanding than yeah. anybody else could. And I, I think back to a lot of my 73 question interviews where like, especially my orthopedic surgeon one, OBGYN, neurology um, that showcase you know, like, immigrant um physicians and all the comments were flooded with thank you so much for having this physician on because finally i see someone who looks like me and therefore like i feel more confident that i can pursue this career so i, I would love for you to dive into like how that, that cultural identity and background has impacted you know, not just your uh, social media career but your medical career too absolutely um, I'll talk about faith first, just because I think that is probably the pillar I rely on as not only one that motivated me to pursue this field, but also that motivates me to do what I do every day. And um, I think, you know, in regards to that, I think, you know, we talk about helping others, serving mankind, um, but really like it's it's an honor to do something that makes me feel like I'm praying every day. You know, even if I um, kind of slack, I think that the work we do really does, you know, if you do it with a good heart and the right intentions, it's like helping others is like, to me, a form of prayer. So it's really nice to feel like you can do something like that as a career. And I know that like a lot of jobs help people, but it's crazy the moments I've had with patients um, that involve like prayer, that involve like their mentioning of God or their faith. And it's moments like that, that really strike me as the most special, I think, in my work, because I think it's like something deeper when you connect on that level. And I we talked about this previously, right? But like, there's been moments where I may not share the same faith as a patient, but I still feel so connected when they bring theirs up. And I think that there's so much beauty in that. And there's so much um, just like magic and like kind of sharing those moments with people and connecting with them on a deeper, deeper level. Um, that's the faith part of it. And I think the cultural part of it is like we mentioned earlier, which is that sometimes, you know, just being immigrants or kids of immigrants, we lose um, kind of our roots sometimes, especially when we have such a busy schedule and we've chosen demanding careers. And it's really nice to now kind of own the things that we may have forgotten um, growing up and using those values and maybe um, the cultural background to serve people who look like us and then inspire people who look like us, who um, can feel like they can do it too, just like you said. Yeah. And leave your, this is Pakistani, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and so for anybody wondering, uh, my last name is Wynn, so you can probably <laughs> guess what ethnicity I am. Um, it's one, one of the two Vietnamese last names, like Wynn and Tran. Um, but I, I would love to know, because, you know, both you know, Southeast Asian, East Asian, as well as, you know, South Asian, Middle Eastern, and I would argue even like African culture is deeply, weirdly deeply rooted in medicine, um, you know, mm -hmm. for better or worse. 
So I would love to hear how, you know, your culture growing up influenced your view of the role of a doctor and like your pursuit of a career in medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think it's kind of like a, sorry, there's a mosquito. I just tried Okay. I just killed it. Uh, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Um, I think that it's interesting because I think that obviously our cultures really value like physicians and like, I would say like three careers that were encouraged to pursue uh, law, medicine, and engineering, probably, you know, it's like almost like every Asian, South Asian parent's dream. Um, but it's so interesting. I, I got a lot, you know, my parents are very supportive, but they never really told me to like become a physician. They just said, do what you love. Um, and I find that um, there is reverence. I used to always wonder like, why do they put so much value on titles and, you know, these careers? But I realize now that I think they just value education. They value like the chance to serve others. And those careers just happen to do both. And so I think because of our background, my background, I've come to kind of respect when, you know, the things that I would hear growing up from, you know, if it wasn't my parents, except family, um, this, this deep respect they have for this career doesn't make it better than any other. Just, I think I look at it differently now because I think before I'd hear like my brother, like, you know, cousins complaining, like, why are we always, you know, told to pursue this career. But now I kind of see our parents' point of view. You know, they came here with these like big dreams, gave up a lot. And I think they just want us to be in, they want us to be respected. They want us to be in a position where we can take care of ourselves and help others. And so um, tying that all together, I just think that our cultural values in a way like do help us. So like where we may come from a position where we are disadvantaged in some ways. I think our cultural our culture does value um, like, you know, education and we talk about it at home. And I think it would be wrong to say that that doesn't help us in our career. And so um, I just wanted to point out that as much as it's annoying sometimes, I'm sure there's tons of people who find encouragement that their parents support their dreams and kind of maybe can help them navigate it. Them. And, oh gosh, what are, what are the definitions here? Like, what what is? Are you a first generation? Wait, does for, okay. First off, is first generation immigrant? Does that mean that you were born outside of the U.S. and then came here? I can can we get a ruling? Yeah, I would love honestly. I want clarity on that too because I think that I always thought first generation means like first to go to college in the United States, or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, David, our producer said okay. Uh, we got first gen- <laughs> the magical hand coming from off the screen. Uh, first generation immigrants are the first foreign born family members to gain citizenship or permanent residency in the country. So I guess if you were born in the con- in the U.S., you would be second generation. So I was not born first in the or US. second generation. I I was born in Pakistan. So you are first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Interestingly enough, I came here when okay. I was pretty young, but. Definitely feel like that part of my life shaped me. Man, now now I'm curious because um, <laughs> for me, I'm a second, I guess by that definition, second generation um, immigrant because uh, my parents came over uh, during the Vietnam War when they were like 9, 11 years old, both of them very, very young. So my parents were similar oh. to you where they came over young. So they were here long enough to grow up within the American healthcare system i mean not healthcare system educational system um <laughs> and then you know go to college my dad uh graduated from drexel mom from university of arkansas you know so i, I don't think they're necessarily out of touch with american culture and especially on the end of like pursuing a career you know i, I think it's very stereotypical for um, immigrant parents would be like, yeah, doctor or bus or lawyer or bus, you know, wh- whatever it may be. And so I'm curious to know how it was for you being, I guess, first. Like you're, you're the one kind of paving the way, like my parents did. So interesting. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. In that sense, I was the first to attend college in the United States, you know, for my family. Um, I was the first to fill out applications and honestly help my parents sometimes like with whatever questions they had. Um, So, 
though my parents do come from an educated background back home, they kind of started all over when they came here. And honestly, it was heartbreaking to watch. It was, it's been my motivation like ever since because, um, you know, it, it's really sad when, especially I'm sure you know stories of immigrants from overseas who like, you know, struggle to convert their degrees or they can't work as what they were back home. And those stories really resonate with me. And so that was the story of my parents. And I think that that's, that's been a huge reason why I feel like I developed certain like leadership qualities is because I was kind of like the leader at home at times, you know? And so as much as I can sit here and say like, oh my gosh, like my life was harder because of it. I think that like I always said, it made me, I think, gain some really valuable skills. Are you the oldest child? Yes. <laughs> I I was like, oh, everything you're saying, this is the old, oldest sibling <laughs> of an Asian family. Because I was like, ah, yes, this sounds like me. Because um, uh, I think, oddly enough, there is that, like, cultural standard where the older sibling is, like, just the third parent in a way yeah Yeah, absolutely (laughs) they they are almost like thrust into a position of leadership whether or not they like it and and so you know you see a lot of very strong willed and you know i would argue borderline stubborn uh (laughs) oldest siblings of uh immigrant families which is not necessarily a, a bad thing i think it's a very uh unique trait that I would argue, unless unless you've also been through it, you don't really know what we're talking about. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree. And I think that there is, as much as you should watch, like how far this leadership goes, obviously there's, you know, there's boundaries you have to draw with, like, are you like becoming a bossy person now? Are you like a control freak? Like you have to think about these things actively at some point, because I think sometimes our experiences tend to, like shape us and then we have to then modify right and like pull back and be like okay like I can't be oldest child in this situation so yeah I think it's like a stressful role but I think it's definitely one that teaches you a lot and I think it sounds so crazy but in a weird way like it helps you then navigate your journey as a doctor because you're kind of put back into this like leadership of a healthcare team role um and so I can't tell you how many personal statements I've read that are like relating that to, you know, their, how that, you know, shaped them in their career. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would be lying to say if it wasn't part of mine. Uh, as I was well. going to say. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so fast forward to like the pre-med stage and like the medical school application, um, you're bringing all these childhood learned traits to the table how do you think um that impacted your application process and not just that but even the little nuances of like oh culturally especially as like you know a pakistani female like i i understand that there's a lot of pressure to be like don't waste your don't waste your 20s pursuing a career in medicine get married and like like that unfortunately is just like centuries built in stereotype so yeah i can never speak to it i never will because obviously i'm not a female so i would love to hear your perspective on that because i think a lot of people are probably in those shoes right now andy i'm actually so shocked that you know about this how did you know about the impending pressure that south asian females face for marriage i mean all females do but specifically south asian females (laughs) I, I have a lot of friends. So. <laughs> that's that's so cool, you know, um, because that's exactly like it. That's so true. Um, I think that is actually something we don't talk about enough is that there is almost like this, I don't want to say discouraging. I'm thinking of the right word. Maybe like pressure that perhaps by going into a demanding field like medicine, you don't prioritize or care about your having a family. And that's just like with every, I think any, every woman in medicine feels faces that. But um, when, you know, especially I can speak for my culture, I think that it's like this competition of like, 
oh, like you're going to medical school, that's great, but this person who's your age is getting engaged and then they're gonna get married. And then you're like in your mid twenties and oh, you're in medical school, but now more people are getting married. And then you're like, the people make you feel like the clock is ticking. And I'm very lucky that my parents weren't like that. Very, very lucky, I know in that sense. But I know so many people who whose family was like that. And I would be lying if I said I, did, I didn't face pressure from like outside of my immediate nuclear family. Um, definitely did have people who, um, tried to make me feel bad about my choices, but that's where, again, like your, you know, I think if you do things with an honest heart and you know that you're doing this for the right reasons and you, you know, if you want to have a partner as well, like those things will happen. I think people forget, like, I, I, I hope I, when I say it's not comfortable controversial, but there's more people who are married than people who are doctors, right? In the world, like most people do get married, right? And so you will like find someone, right? Um, right? Like if you think about it, like more people are married, right? That, um, statistically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I honestly told myself that I was like, it's okay. Like statistically, like I will probably get married, but I also knew how hard I worked to get to the places I wanted to be in. And I did not, I felt like it would be harder for me to become a doctor. So I was like super focused and luckily, like, you know, my mom was super supportive. Amazing. Like she obviously instilled in us the values of like education, male or female. She always told us it was a priority, but she always instilled those values in us. And so it was honestly, I realize now how, how I had a leverage from a lot of people who don't have those experiences. And I think that that's why a lot of times I use my space to talk about that. And I think especially South Asian women who follow me completely understand why I advocate for that. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. I have so many more questions now that I have <laughs> this can of worms. Um, but before, before we get into that, take a quick break uh, to thank our sponsor. So we will be right back. I said before numerous times on this channel and I still stand by it. Practice tests and practice questions are by far the most efficient and powerful way to prepare for your standardized exams, something medical training has a disappointingly large amount of. Uh, but in order to lighten the load and help you excel in your tests, I am proud to partner with TrueLearn, the sponsor of today's episode. TrueLearn is a data-driven test prep resource with a 100% pass rate trusted by top institutions such as Stanford, Mayo Clinic, Harvard, and much more. Their smart banks with questions written by content experts give you the tools to succeed on crucial board exams. As a medical student, they offer prep for Comlex 1 through 3, USMLE 1 and Step 2 CK, as well as the USMLE and COMAT shelf exams. But it doesn't stop there. You have the same attention to detail and world-class practice test questions for PA, dental hygiene, MA, NP, nursing, OT, PT, speech therapy, pharmacy, and farm tech licensing exams. So it's not just limited to physicians, uh, but for all my residents, which I guess will be me soon, uh, you also have resources for all your in-training exams, such as the ABA basic for anesthesia, abcite for surgery, uh, ABEM for EM, and much more. I've been using some of their smart banks to prepare for my away rotations, and I've been blown away by their performance analytics, real-time national benchmarking, and thorough explanations that help me to learn the most from even my most facepalm-inducing and correct answers. With thousands of questions for each exam, you will be sure to have all the knowledge to knock your exams out of the park. If you would like to try TrueLearn, use code NDMD25 for $25 off your first subscription. Again, that's code NDMD25 for $25 off TrueLearn's incredible smart banks. Happy studying. Uh, best of luck to all those prepping for exams as you watch and listen to this podcast. And of course, thank you to TrueLearn for your support on this podcast and channel. Okay, we're back. And I cannot wait to dive a little bit deeper uh, into the can of worms that I opened. And honestly, thank you for being impressed with my uh, knowledge of, <laughs> you know, South Asian culture. I have a lot of friends um, that grew up in that. So um, it's familiar. And I'm not going to lie, you know, Southeast Asian as well as East Asian culture is 
not too far off as well. But you know, I obviously I I'm a I'm a guy, um, so there are nuances on that end, and you bring a very valuable perspective on your journey. So, you know, you talked a lot about uh, the pressure for pursuing a career in medicine as a female. Now, fast forward a little bit more. How did that impact you during medical school and, you know, especially in your path to choosing a specialty? You know what's so funny? I think, so I always wanted to do primary care. And I think that sometimes I get frustrated when people think that I did it solely because like, I want a family because, you know, when I was picking a specialty, I definitely looked into things that, um, that would give me like work-life balance. Um, obviously I would like to have a family one day. So, um, I did keep that in mind, but I also really, really respect people who do other specialties who that may not have that kind of balance or that don't think about, you know, having a family. And I think that both decisions are equally great and for two different people and that's okay. But it's so interesting. Cause I think I've, and I'm saying this because recently ran to someone that was like, Oh great. You chose like fam med. That's great. You can have a family or you can. And it's like, no, I chose this because this is what I've always wanted to do. Um, and obviously there's always comments that girls get that guys would never, right? <laughs> but it's, I think it's important to recognize that people may do things for different reasons and that's okay. Um, I also, um, I, I so going back to your question, I think that when I was picking a specialty, I was kind of in the back of my head thinking like, oh my God, people are gonna think that I did this only because of, you know, so I have family and, you know, I don't want to prove these people right that I, you know, I'm falling into the pressure. But the reality was, is that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do primary care for like as long as I can remember. And um, that was what I ended up doing. And I do appreciate, you know, that I have um, a schedule where I could work in a clinic nine to five and that is actually what I want. So um, to answer your question, Yes, I think that I did have those thoughts, but eventually I did what I wanted to always, which was primary care. And, you know, a lot of your content, especially on Instagram, I see is very focused on like you know, personal success because you know, something to remember uh, when choosing a medical specialty is like people are going to think what, what they want. Everybody's going to talk. Everybody's going to judge. But at the end of the day, who lives with that decision? You do. So like you have to make the decision that's best for you. And, um, you know, like you, you said you got a lot of comments um, coming from specifically like South Asian women relating to some of these struggles. Have you gotten any comments of women who desire to do those specialties, like surgery, um, that are struggling to combat like that pressure? Yeah, it's still a good question. Um, I definitely have had people DM me who are following me and they tell me like they want to do the specialty, which their family tells them is too demanding. And I really feel for them because I, you know, I can't imagine being in a situation where I loved a specialty so much and didn't have the support of people close to me. Um, and to those people, I tell them like there's tons of successful surgeons and you know you name it specialty i'll let's fill in the blank with whatever someone thinks is demanding that are great moms great wives and they you know they find a balance it may not be the same balance that somebody else has but it's a balance that works for them and so i think it's important to do what you love i know it sounds so cheesy but to do what you love and then also like write down like a list of your things you want for your future like in 10 years and Think about like how everything fits in, right? Because I also think back to my point, like if there is somebody that is like, well, I want to do this because it gives me the option to do X, Y, and Z. That's also okay. I think we should accept, be accepting of people's decisions and not think that it makes them less of a doctor or like less of a future wife or future mom because they choose it. And so that's, I think, the conversation that people are having now on social media, which I love. But like, just because someone doesn't do something the way you expect doesn't mean that they're not good at their job. 
Ding, 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 winner, amen, clip that, let the congregation rise. <laughs> I, like, the the thing that everybody needs to get out of this is that, like, you know, if you are not doing it the way that, like, you think, does not make them any less invested in, you know, both those roles. And, like, I, obviously, the camera was probably focused on you, but, like, I was nodding my head uh, enthusiastically. On my side, because it's such an, you know, I, I've come across this too, especially with my media work where, you know, I've thankfully found a way to make, you know, both influence both for the better. Um, but especially with the whole like family and relationship topic. And that's something that I've personally had to learn as well, where like you're supposed to let your medical training and time build the other side of you um and you know the characteristics that you get from medicine should make you a a better partner a better mother father better friend even and so like you know the fact that a lot of people think that like you have to have one or the other is such a misconception um it's a misconception deep rooted in you know culture uh i both I, i think immigrant and american culture to be honest um, but I'm just so glad you said that. Cause I'm just like that. If there's one thing you get out of this podcast, like you please listen to that over again. Oh my gosh. And I love that you said, um, that education, um, makes us better fill in the blank because it does. I, you know, I don't know if it's like where I read this, but it was about how like you educate a woman, you educate like a, you know, a nation. A community because you know like i'm thinking of all the counter arguments that maybe men will have maybe they won't be but hopefully they won't have these arguments but i think about all the things that people can say in rebuttal and i think about how you know me going through this process like i've learned so much and i think that this education will help me be a hopefully you know good mom one day and i don't th- i do think about these things when i'm going through Uh, training. And that's not to say that people who don't go through it are not great moms. You can be, but what I'm trying to point, prove the point is that there, it's not like you're taking away from your personality because you decide to go through more training. If anything, I hope that you can find a way to combine the two experiences to, you know, be better at your future role if you decide to as a mom. So um, like you said, you know, does it make us better than anyone else? But it would be really wrong to discourage someone to pursue their passion if that involves going through medical school and training because they think that it's taking away from, you know, who they are, because I think these things do make you better. There's so much I learned from um, medical training that made me a better person than I was yesterday or like 10 years ago. You know, I learned so much about working hard, you know, um, integrity, discipline, you know, time management, like there's so many key skills that you have to have to succeed that I hope to use those skills like in the future in whatever role that I find myself in. Yep, absolutely. Um, and just a side note, have y'all seen uh, that new study that came out where uh, patients of female surgeons have statistically better outcomes? No? Yeah, you should probably check it out. <laughs> score one for the female surgeons out there shout out i know that I, made I me so it, happy i thought that was a really cool um report um I, I know you posted about it i i thought it was incredible some of my favorite surgeons are um you know female surgeons as well i just think you know excuse my language but they're just some of the most badass people in the world um okay so now kind of rolling back you you, you said you know, you have your experiences growing up culturally and then mold it into your medical experience and then the medical experience kind of gives back as well so i'm curious because i've i've had a couple of these um interactions how has your culture background impacted the way that you see patients and connect to patients interesting i you know it's i don't know how to comment on this because i don't think that like my cultural background in general like made my interactions better but i will say that they definitely shaped my interactions in the sense that when I saw 
patients who looked like me spoke my language, it just heightened the, you know, conversations further. Like I think one of my favorite experiences in residency was me making a box honey patient chai, which is like our version of obviously I know people know what chai is, but we have like black tea with milk. And so she was um, going through some treatment and I asked her like, is there anything else I can do for you? And she was like, can you get me some chai? I was like, absolutely. And I honestly was, I've never been happier to deliver chai to somebody because I was so honored that one, she trusted me to do that. And two, that we kind of connected on a deeper level where she felt comfortable asking me that. So I think that if there's culture that's tied to that, perhaps, but I think most cultures would encourage that. And so I will say my connections have been deeper when I can connect with somebody as anyone can um, with the same language. Um, And so I think that made her comfortable to ask me that. And I think that was like a top three moment for me in residency. Just curious, did you grow up in an area that had a large Pakistani population? I actually did. And we talked about this in their other podcasts, but I think that that played such a huge role in how comfortable I felt and feel with my identity as Pakistani American. Um, There's a lot of things that I think, you know, I can speak the language. I feel comfortable wearing our clothes. I feel comfortable going to like events that are all Pakistani. I feel happy, not just comfortable, but I think there's so much of me that is shaped by that experience. And, you know, people always say like your childhood stays with you. And I completely agree. I think it's, it's that childhood and still being near that area that really makes me feel so comfortable with who I am and my identity. And I think that's a huge blessing because I've come across Pakistanis who haven't grown up um, in areas like that, or just areas that are separated from other Pakistanis and they feel like less in touch with their culture. Um, and they're like, wow, like, it's so cool that you can do this and wear this. And growing up, I would feel like embarrassed sometimes when, you know, this is like before I came to terms with my identity and like my culture, but I would, you know, when I would have like lunch that would have like a strong smell. Cause my mom like put all the spices in it. And, um, now I look back and I'm like, thank God that I was, you know, I now can accept that and love that. And again, I realize now that when I was growing up, I was only feeling like that because I hadn't, wasn't old enough to realize like, hey, you can't accept your culture. You're around people who are like you, who look like you, who talk like you. So yeah, that plays a huge role in how I feel with my culture and how I accept it, you know, as packed for the American. And, you know, it's funny you mention because I'm a representative of the other side. And so um, I actually was invited to give a talk at like a summer seminar, uh, literally like a couple weeks ago for the like Asian Pacific Islander, like medical student association. It's, it's nationwide. Um, and I was preparing for that talk. And, um, you know, of course they wanted me to talk about like medicine, social media and everything. But the morning of the talk, I woke up and was like, hold on. This is the first like Asian American focused event that I've ever one attended two, been invited to speak at. This has a lot of a deeper meaning to me. And, you know, excuse me for my anecdote. This is probably an NDMD exclusive. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was I did not grow up uh, around a large Vietnamese community. Uh, I grew up in the South and there's two kinds of South. Uh, there is uh, country South and then there's country club South. Uh, I was definitely in like a country club South area. <laughs> and so, you know, growing, growing up in like vineyard vines, boat shoots or boat shoes, uh, Southern tide, that was the thing. And, you know, in high school, like I, I, I remember distinctly like being very embarrassed of like my Vietnamese culture. I was one of thirteen East Asians in a graduating class of three hundred twenty-one, <clears throat> and like, you know, I was student body president, student section leader, all that stuff that like doesn't matter anymore. But like, in order to get those positions, I had to act and talk and dress, not like 
how I grew up. And so, honestly, you know, I tell people that I'm like four thirds lingual. You know, that's my one one of very few regrets in my life. Where you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I have like this weird broca's aphasia um, where I can fluently understand Vietnamese, but like the connection to responding and speaking is is severed. And I think that was severed, you know, sometime in elementary or middle school because I just like didn't grow up around a lot of people <clears throat> that spoke the language and understood where I was coming from. And, you know, it wasn't until college that I found and hung out with other East Asians. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't have to explain why these little like cultural things matter. You just do them. You understand because you were also raised in it. You know, the little things never showing up to a friend's house empty handed. Always take your shoes off uh, at the door. Just like those little things where you, know, you don't, they're small, but it's hard to explain unless you've actually grown up in it. And even like going out to eat, I was like, oh my gosh, you guys like eat this stuff? Like, I don't have to explain the entire menu to you. And it was like for the first time, it's going like, oh my gosh, there are people like me and finally i can like rediscover this side of me that you know i tried to keep suppressed for so long and you know i worked really hard to keep the little vietnamese that i know and it's actually helped me a ton connecting with viewers connecting with patients too where as soon as I walk in the room, they're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, you're a young Vietnamese guy. Like, you can tell, you can tell, like, you know what you're doing. And it, it's almost like a, a beam of pride uh, whenever they, they see me. And it's something that, like, I just was not used to growing up uh, from the people I was around. And, you know, I only recently have worked on coming to terms with that uh, I, i've carried a lot of embarrassment with it with that like didn't self-denial for a long time but um, i spoke about this at this um event and then a lot of them chimed up and went thank you so much for bringing this up because we experienced the same thing or you know i i grew up like not liking my culture and not like my own people because of like that outside influence and now I'm regaining it and so I think that embarrassment came a lot from me thinking I was the only one or me thinking I was wrong for going through that experience but I, I go on this long you know anecdote to say that you're not alone in fact that's a very 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 common experience of Asian Americans in um, the U.S., so like say that. Don't be afraid to you know re-embrace your culture, no matter what stage of life you're at. Um, I guarantee you, people welcome you with open arms. And you know, Dr. K, I, I hope that your background has helped you to connect uh, with other people, your your followers, and um, also I hope your content echoes you know, familiarity with those that struggle. Um, with the same things that like your background and culture typically brings. Absolutely. And I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that's like not said enough sometimes. And it takes, again, like courage to say that because it is like kind of when you look at it, kind of sad, like why was I afraid or why did I not know enough about my culture? Why did I not connect with it? Right. These are all valid questions to have. And sometimes when you have them at this older age, it's almost like you're making it for lost time. Like I know I wanted to like, even though I was around a lot of people who spoke my language, I want to like speak it better. I want to learn how to read and write, you know? And so I'm glad that you, like we talked about last time, like have these goals of like, I want to work on this because now I realize this is important to me. And I think it's about embracing who you are and what makes you different. Cause I think that's what makes you unique. And at the end of the day, all we really have is what makes us unique. So um, I'm really happy that you had that conversation that we're having this today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, getting close to the end, kind of wrapping up our thoughts, uh, 
I just I love having your um, experience and thoughts on this kind of stuff. So, like, what is what is your advice for the people that quite literally look like you, you know, women of you know immigrant cultures and backgrounds that want to pursue a career in medicine one day? Because you know, it's it, there's a lot of them, and you know, they all need encouragement from somebody that has you know made it oh you're so sweet i i would say i'm always going to be a work in progress because there's always so much more to learn but if you're in a position where you want to pursue medicine and whether you're south asian or not um you probably experience your own unique triumphs and you know also failures so um i would say go for that thing that really makes you scared because sometimes it's that dream that really scares you and people tell you that you can't do that's actually like best for you and meant for you. So that's my first advice. The second thing is that just because it's hard or just because you fail at first doesn't mean that it's not meant for you. Just keep persisting. I think that's the name of the game is like trying and keep trying at something because you love it. And lastly, just remember that no one is living your life but you. So if it makes you happy, it does not matter what somebody else thinks of it. Do it because like I said, (laughs) there's you will be fine. Everything will work out. And if being a doctor is your dream, I promise you, if you continue and work hard, it's achievable. And if you want more specific advice, follow my Instagram because I do post about this kind of stuff all the time. (laughs) I was going to say, where where can people find you? And uh, I believe you just started a YouTube channel too, right? Oh my gosh. Yes, Andy. After we talked, I put out like my first video. It was honestly trash, but it's okay because I'm working on being better every day, 1% better every day. Um, You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at D-R-K-A-Y-D-O, Dr. K-D-O. All righty. Thank you so much, Dr. K. And again, like, I know this is kind of a, I mean, to me, it's a heavier topic, but uh, it's something that's very important to me and something that I definitely want to talk about more or um, on my channel because again I, I feel I felt like I was isolated in my experiences but obviously I'm not at all so if there's any topics especially you know discussing Asian American experience immigrant experience um, you know, throughout medicine or just life in general uh, please leave those topics uh, in the comments I'd love to you know either make a formal video on it or have more conversations about it because again it i don't think enough can be said uh and there sometimes just needs somebody that looks like you to say it or for you to yeah, believe it absolutely thank you for having these conversations oh, Amy. oh thank thank you for uh taking the time to do take three and uh <laughs> for everybody thank you for watching and listening see you in the next one transition back throw that in as a as a uh, blooper okay